Welcome back to Mad Props, another episode of Mad Props. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate you um, joining us again after a couple of many weeks off. <laughs> um, we're going to go a little bit, uh, just kind of some updates. Sometimes we just need to talk, you know, but I um, want to make sure we got an episode out there. Before we start the podcast, please, please, please follow us at Mad Props Pod on Instagram and Facebook. Or, more specifically, follow us at Schnabel Studios on Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter slash X. We just had a recent surge on TikTok. We went from about 60 followers to over 400 followers in about two days. So if you want to get in early before we become just super famous, <laughs> uh, go ahead and follow us on TikTok at Schnabel Studios on all that stuff. You can also see some of the great stuff we've been doing. We just released a video, a short video of Ezekiel Elliott mic'd up at his pro camp that we recorded with Schnabel Studios and Pro Camps. So you can see that now. A full length version will be coming out soon, but you can get the preview now at Schnabel Studios anywhere you get your social media. You can also visit SchnabelStudios.com and see everything we're doing. And see more of the podcast there as well. We appreciate you being here. All right. So it's been a couple of weeks since getting on the pod. I'm happy to be back on the pod um, talking about some stuff. This is kind of going to be a mixed bag. I'm going to tell everybody now. This is a mixed bag. So if you want to hear my opinion on a couple of things, I'm going to talk about um, the Yankees a little bit because the postseason's coming up and I have some thoughts on that. Um, some hip hop stuff and just some other stuff that, that I can talk about, get off my mind. Cause it's been a little bit since I've been on the podcast. So if you're interested in hearing that stuff, please stick around. If not, eh, there's always next week. All right, let's get to the intro. Let's get to the song. Let's get to the podcast. This is mad prop. <laughs> So we're still closing in on that coveted 100th episode, and I haven't really had a guest in a while. I may, I may have a, a buddy of mine that everybody knows, at least he's been on a couple of times, come on in the next couple of weeks. But overall, it's just hasn't been um, it hasn't been easy to get people. I'm going to I'm going to explain why um, coming up here. Also, I want to talk about the Yankees. We talked about that a little bit. We're going to we're going to talk about the Yankees a little bit. Um, talk about hip hop a little bit, uh, the culture these days and, and, and my interest in it. I'm a big hip hop head. Um, that's Triple H, but not the wrestler. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, and I want to start, though, by why it's kind of been so long. I know this podcast can get a little repetitive with um, the updates of what's going on in the world of Mad Props and Schnabel Studios. But I will tell you right now, the world of Schnabel Studios has been been flipped on its head um we've gone through a couple couple big client stuff we've gone through a lot of shoots um we do shoots you know i'm doing a couple shoots a week uh me being the only videographer on staff because the staff is very small the paid staff is one right now um it's just i have to do what i can do with what i got so that's why the podcast has been kind of lacking um, a lot of shoots, a lot of editing, emailing people, um, reaching out to potential clients, just kind of building that 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 business, you know, building that business. You know, if, if you follow us on social media at Schnabel Studios, you'll see like we've had some good clients. You know, we just worked with PJ Washington. We've been working with this thing called the Brody League. I want to talk about that in a second. We've been working with True Lacrosse. Um, we have a couple of shoots coming up with some local businesses here in Dallas. Um, and there's other people that I've been talking with. So we're building, but in this building, being um, the only person really trying to push this forward right now, um, because it's it's a sole proprietor business, it's just been hard to get behind the mic and talk to people. But on top of that, it also makes it really hard to go get guests because you know, I'm, I'm spending so much time talking to people about their business, getting people on um, as a guest has just been, it's just been really difficult. It's been really difficult, but I'm trying to do it still. I'm talking to some people, um, talking and, and, and speaking of that, a former guest, 
Uh, now in, it's now in remission, but um, we want to give our best wishes to Darren Nefsi, who was diagnosed with breast cancer. It's now in remission, and she's doing her, her recovery. We want to give her our best wishes. Um, meant to say that at the top of the pod, but um, wanna we want to shout her out because she's amazing. We love her here, and we want to make sure we give our, uh, our our blessings and our prayers and our best wishes to her. So let's start off at the top. Schnabel Studios has been really going. Um, we've been doing a lot of work. Uh, we have some interns on staff. They're all unbelievably amazing um, interns. I can't believe how good they are um, because I, you know, I knew they would be good because I vetted them and I have a good track record, honestly, with uh, vetting interns. But man, the, these six have been really good and they've really shown that they really helped Schnabel Studios a lot. They really have helped Schnabel Studios a lot. And I'm, I'm happy that they're part of the Schnabel Studios family. Like, I'm happy that they're here to help us out and they're, help, help, they're really just, I can't say enough about them. But with that being said, it's just, there's been a lot of stuff going on with Schnabel Studios that's been, made it hard to get here. One of those things that's been going on, um, one of those things that's been going on is uh, Schnabel Studios has started recording with uh, this thing called the Brody League. Now, the Brody League is not a um, – I, 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 some people I knew knew it. Some people I know don't know it. But the Brody League is this basket. it's a men's basketball league. But it's really more than that. It's crazy what they do. They, they have videographers. They have photographers. They have media days. Um, they basically treat the the people that play in this league like they're professionals. And there are some really good players in the league. There are some players you'd expect to be in the league. But it's a really cool concept of a league. It's based out of Canada, uh, but now it's in the United States. They just started in Dallas, and we partnered with them to record them every week for their for their videos. Um, you can follow at Brody, Brody Dallas, Texas, or TX, and uh, you could see all the stuff we're doing with them. But it's just an interesting concept for a league. I mean, I, I've played in many different types of men's leagues. I've played in flag football leagues. I've played in baseball, uh, many baseball leagues, as the people of this podcast may know. Um, I've played in, in basketball leagues. I'm playing in one right now. But I've never really, you, you know, you just feel like you're in a men's league. You go, you play, you go home. You hope you win. When you do win, you don't really, whatever. It's like, whatever. It's like, yeah, I want to win, but, you know, I'm not you win you lose that's it you just go home and you keep living your life um but this this league like you win it feels like it like when you win the championship you get a a replica o'brien trophy um you get rings you get shirts you get hats you get all that stuff like it, it feels legit it feels like you've won a championship and it's just really cool to uh to 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 be a part of it right now and and obviously like i said the brody league is just starting Definitely look up the Brody League if you've never heard of it because it's a pretty interesting concept um, and it's really cool. And we're working with them. So if you look at the Dallas one, all that stuff you see in that Schnabel Studios right there. So I really wanted to talk about that because that's one of our that's one of our main clients right now that we're working with, other than True Lacrosse. Um, okay, let's get off of Schnabel Studios for a minute. All right, the New York Yankees. So I, I just took a big turn. So people. You might sound confused. You might feel confused. Um, I got to see the Yankees finally this year uh, when they played the Texas Rangers, being based in Dallas. Don't really get to see them that often, but I did get to see them when they played the Texas Rangers. Um, We had good seats for two games. We were gifted seats for game one. It was, like, right behind home plate. It was it was actually – it was right behind the the visiting – batter circle so we were right behind the Yankees batter circle and man it was a cool experience like we were right up close to every player we were close to the action Garrett Cole pitched that day he pitched pretty dang well too um it was good they won like 10 to 3 or 10 to 4 Clay Holmes tried to blow it um which we'll get back to that in a second but Clay Holmes tried to blow it he didn't they won and the Yankees got the first game win we probably should have ended right there we should have said all right we saw a win we don't need to go anymore Um, Game two, we didn't have as good of seats. We actually stood in a standing room only section because it just made more sense to do that um, than go all the way up to our seats. We just got the cheapest seats we could possibly find. We spent, because we were gifted one day, we're like, why don't we spend decent money on tickets for 
the one of the games and then we'll just get the cheapest tickets for the other game that way we can go to all three games so we did we got the cheapest tickets we just stood in standing room only which is like right right behind um the left center like left center section so like closer to where the 200s would be in most stadiums um and the yankees lost in a walk-off grand slam and clay holmes we'll get to him in a second but it was probably one of the most devastating games i've ever gone to as a yankees fan um just the the minute the minute it was 3-1 i said to mary i said this isn't good he's going to serve him up one I didn't think – or no, he's going to hit it. That's what I said. He's going to hit it. Um, I didn't think he was going to hit a grand slam, but I knew he was going to hit the ball. Anyway, it was probably one of the top three, if not if not one. It may have been number one hardest game to go to as a Yankee fan. It was really tough to watch that. And I get, it, like, it's historic and he's a rookie and it was a big moment in baseball. I don't care. <laughs> I want to see the Yankees win. They should have won that game. Um, in many ways, actually, uh, which we'll get to in a second as well. So game three, we got really good seats. Um, if you go to if you go to a baseball game in Texas, um, in Dallas, or all in Arlington, get the seats that are located like it's like thirty sections thirty seven through forty two. They're right behind uh, left field. All concessions except for beer are free. Free hot dogs, free burgers, free popcorn, free fountain drinks free all that stuff uh i think there's chicken there everything's free and the tickets weren't that bad i think we paid like 40 dollars a person so 80 dollars. well with Ticketmaster obviously being a scam it was like 120 or 150 dollars even though it was 40 dollars a ticket somehow they got you know it doubled in price um anyway but we got in for decently priced and everything was free so we didn't have to pay for anything on top of that um, except for parking, right? Yeah, we paid for parking, which was $15. So we paid an extra $15. We'd have to pay for food. We'd have to pay for drink. Um, we got to have all that stuff for free. Now, the thing that stunk about that was the Yankees still didn't play well, which is very unfortunate because you want them to play well. You want them, you want them to be good, but they didn't play well again. Um, lost. They lost the series, um, two games to one, and it was very unfortunate because I – and actually that game ended in a heartbreaker as well. Giancarlo Stanton looked like he was about to hit a home run to put him within one. They were down like 10 to one or something going into the ninth. Final score was like 10 to four, 10 to five, something like that, but it looked like Giancarlo was about to hit a home run, um, got robbed of the home run. Guy jumped up. It was going over the wall, caught it, ended the game. Um, that was really unfortunate, uh, especially because I love seeing Giancarlo hit home runs. He does it a lot when we go to the games. So if the Yankees, if you're hearing this, like I would say 90% of the time we go see a Yankee game, Mary and myself, Giancarlo Stanton homers. He did it in Seattle. He did it in New York. He did it in uh, – now he did it in Texas. He almost does. I, I I can't say every single time now because, you know, he didn't do it in the two games we went to after the first. He did it in the first game, which we'll get to that in a second. But Yankees, if you're listening, hook us up. We you know get us as many games as possible. Giancarlo can hit 120 home runs if we go to all the games. Um, but anyway, they lost. That was disappointing. So overall, disappointing. Great to see the Yankees though. Um, let me talk about that. What I just said. I got a story about that, and then I want to get into the Yankees themselves. So the, before we went to the first game of the, se- the series, I sent a um, I sent a tweet out to the real Michael K, and I said, "At real Michael K, just want to let you know that my girlfriend Mary and I are going to the Yankees game tonight. And every single time we go to the game, Giancarlo Stan hits a home run. Just be ready for the call. That night, Giancarlo Stan." Hit a home run. Well, I don't think it ever got to Michael K. I, I didn't listen to the broadcast. I'm assuming it didn't. I'm just trying to say I was helping him out. We called it. It was hours before. We called the home run, 
and then he hit a home run. It was one of the many great calls I've had um, predicting things. It's right up there with one time at a Yankee game, I pointed to an exact seat. I think it was like Lyle Overbay was up. Lyle Overbay. He was a Yankee, guys. He was a Yankee. Um, and I said he's going to hit it right there and then he hit a home run to that exact seat. And it was like an opposite way home run, too. I believe it was Lyle Overbay that did that. Um, and then I hope it was Lyle. Was Lyle Overbay? I'm pretty sure he's a Yankee. God, I'm going to look so dumb if I'm thinking of the wrong person. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but then the, the greatest call I've ever had in my life was during the Super Bowl 2013, maybe 14, when the, when, when the Seahawks played the Broncos. I bet somebody $100. Let, let, let me restart this here. Picture this Seahawks Broncos. We're getting, I'm in college. I'm in my college dormitory, which is for people that know who know New Haven. I was in Forest, which is like basically run down apartments. And I, we're, we're like making prop bets basically with each other. And I bet somebody $100 that the, uh, that the Seahawks would win the toss, defer to the second half, and then return the kick for a touchdown. Very obscure, very dumb. But that was the bet. And that is exactly what happened. They deferred the toss, or they deferred the ball, got in the second half, and Percy Harvin famously took it in for a touchdown in a blowout win for the Seahawks. Um, that is probably first or that has to be first or second. The only other, I don't know if you can call it a, I called it thing, or it was just me being, a a, a, a Orlando magic fan that likes JJ Redick a lot. I went to a game. It was nuggets versus Orlando. I believe it was nuggets versus Orlando and Carmelo Anthony was on the team had to have been maybe one of the last years he was there. Cause Vince Carter was also on Orlando at the time. I'd have to see if they crossed paths. Um, I, I, I'm almost positive. Should I, should I double check on this really quick? Let's see. Um, Carmelo. This is great for people listening, which no one's watching because this is an audio only. Um, but while I look this up, I'll, I'll continue the story at least. So Vince Carter was on the Orlando Magic at this time. So this is circa... Let's see. This is circa 20, 2009 to 2011. All right. Let me double check here. 2009. Yeah, to 2011. All right. So this is – I'm correct. It was against Carmelo Anthony. I could have sworn it was. All right. So we're at Orlando versus the Nuggets, and Vince Carter is on Orlando at this time. And uh, I made a bet, and this again, because I'm a I'm, – I'm a – Stan Orlando fan, even back then, when they weren't even that good. Actually, they were pretty good at that time. They went to the finals in 09. But anyway, um, I, I said to my friend, I bet J.J. Redick will lead the entire game in scoring. And he bet that anyone else would. It could have been anyone, right? It could have been Carmelo. I think they had uh, – did they have Iverson at that time? No, they had a different point guard. I don't remember. I don't remember anybody that was on those teams for some reason. It's too long ago. Um, but I, I said, JJ Redick. They said, uh, let's let's see if I can find this exact game and, and I can give, I can restart my my story um, for everybody. It has to be this one, right? They had Chauncey Billups and Mello in there. Yep, this is the exact game. So I can tell you the exact day. I'm actually, you know, I I, I looked it up um, in the middle of a podcast, which, like, can get boring. But for the people that stuck around, this is great. Because I now have the entire box score and the date and everything else. So I can tell you all of the great um, story from this. I should have done this before I started, but I didn't. So we're going to do it now. Um, let me see. Do, 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 do. Okay. 
Let's restart this. I'm probably not going to cut this out, so sorry for everybody that listened to this. All right. So it was, uh, it was March 28th, 2010. I got to imagine that I was either on spring break or we were probably down there for baseball, down in, in Florida for baseball, which is m- most likely correct. Um, my, a, a friend of mine took Carmelo to lead the, the, the game in points, and I took J.J. Redick to lead the game in points. Now, for those of you that don't know, I mean, people know who J.J. Redick is, especially these days, right? But J.J. Redick at the time was like a bench player. He, he, didn't, he didn't start for Orlando. I don't know if he was really ever a starter for anybody, but um, he didn't start for Orlando. He, he came off the bench. So I, it was, I said that he will lead Orlando in points, and they had said Carmelo. So Carmelo did lead in points. He had 26, which is fair. He's Carmelo Anthony. Now, for me to, to tie, I had to have J.J. Redick do it. Now, J.J. Redick, again, not a starter. But a minute and 35 seconds into the game, Vince Carter twists his ankle. He's done. He's out. Bye-bye, Vince. Who plays his minutes? None other than J.J. Redick. 46 minutes and 25 seconds. 23 points. He was 3 for 7 from 3, which is pretty tough, but he was 8 for 15 overall, meaning all he did was miss threes. Um, but because of that, I was able to tie the bet. I remember that I thought he had the most points in the game, but I'm, I'm looking at the box score. So that story was like co- about to be a really big story and ended up being a whatever story because I was wrong about the amount of points that he scored. But anyway... All that being said, I'm, I'm going to just cut it right there. Not in real life, but talking-wise. I'm just going to cut it right there and go right to, uh, right to the Yankees. So, <laughs> anyway, thanks for indulging me. I, um, I, I think the Yankees are actually pretty set up pretty well for the postseason. Um, I know that they're not hitting well. That's a big problem right now for the Yankees. They're not hitting well. Um, they're coming through a lot more clutch than I think they get credit for, um, especially like Soto and some of the bottom of the lineup guys. I, I d- we'll get to that in a second, but they are coming up a little more clutch. But the reason they have to be clutch in the first place is because they're just not hitting. They're not hitting. They're, their offense is very stagnant. It's very slow. It's very it's very low. So I think that can change. They always say the postseason's a crapshoot. We'll see, right? But uh, I think that can change. I think that could be th- different. Um, but the pitching right now is is pretty legit. They have – I know Cortez today, as recording, went down on the 15-day IL. But if they can wrap up the division, which they need to just win two against Baltimore, I think, to do it, maybe one, um, then they can, they can wrap up the division and – they get that time off anyhow, so it's not a big de- it's not a big deal if they get that time off. But the, pit- the starting pitching has been great. The bullpen ever since Clay Holmes, which we'll get to in a second, switch has been pretty good. Um, and and they have six starters. They have six guys they can run out there to start. I mean, right now with Cortez out, they just move Stroman right back into the rotation. Now Stroman hasn't been amazing, but I would take Stroman as my fifth starter, or fourth starter. That's better than anyone else is going to do in the league right now. I mean, look at some of the best teams. The Dodgers have no pitching. They got to go with Flaherty game one because everyone's hurt. Everyone's out. They, people don't have pitching this year. I mean, there's there's good pitchers. There's guys that are going to roll out day one that can do it. But the rest of it, it's not. The Yankees pitching is actually very good this year. The scary thing is they're good in the playoffs every time they go. It's the offense that struggles every single time. So I think this year is going to be a little different. I think Judge is actually going to do really well in the playoffs. Um, I think, you know, eventually it hits, right? Eventually it all comes together. He's starting to pick it back up right now, and that's that's a good thing. If you remember the last couple of years, especially remember his big 60-plus home run season, he struggled at the end of the year, went right into the playoffs, struggled into the playoffs. If you go back and look at his stats, he struggles at the end of the year. And, and this time around, he's actually picking it up towards the end of the year. He's hitting more homers. He's getting on base more. 
Um, he's really starting to get it together. So it's not shocking that he's, he struggled, but I personally think this year is the year he comes together and puts it together, has a decent. I'm not going to say he's going to hit 700, but I think he hits probably around 300, hits a couple of home runs, and helps them, helps them out. Now, the deeper they go, the better he'll probably get because of more reps, more everything. But I just think um, the starting pitching isn't, isn't anything to, to, to be scared of this year. Like when you think of even previous years going against the Astros, going against Cleveland, like Cleveland used to have a really good starting pitching staff. Like their pitching staff, I mean, I don't want to get to class A, but the starting staff isn't anything like I'm, I'm not terrified of. I, I'm not terrified of Houston's starting staff. Um, who are some other playoff teams I, they can think of? Like I'm not. I'm, there's nothing. The Twins starting staff, you know, Cleveland starting staff, the Royals if they get in, they have a couple of good pitchers, but no, I'm not going to worry about them in the postseason. So maybe I eat my words, but I think that this year is this year's a much better year for Judge to go in. There's just not that three rotation starting staff that's going to shut them down, or we hope not. But I, I do like that. Um, Clay Holmes. I couldn't believe that they decided Clay Holmes um, should be the closer in, in back in July. And I'm like most Yankee fans. Like when he said, um, Cashman said, we don't have to worry about that. We're good, blah, blah, blah. It was such BS. It was such BS. Like everybody knew, like, you got to go get somebody. And this whole – this whole thing about keeping prospects is just, it's crazy. This is the tangent I'm going to go off on. So if there was a tangent to happen, it's going to happen right here. And, and, and we're going to wrap up soon. But I have to get this tangent off about the Yankees and their minor league system. The Yankees always have a top minor league system from hype. It's strictly from hype. They don't have a good minor league system every year. They don't have good players every year. If you go back and look at their top prospects, how many have actually worked out? Not many. Not many. And it's they hype up these prospects so much, it builds their trade value. And then in their own heads, they're like, no, no, these guys are actually pretty good. I don't know if they're sitting there evaluating being like, dude, this guy's actually legit. Like, we can't trade him. He's going to be the next X, Y, Z. Like, most of them are not. I was very against them trading Volpe, and they didn't. I was very against Dominguez. Anyone else should be on the table. Even Austin Wells, and I like Austin Wells a lot. I'm glad they kept him. I thought he should even be on the table back when they were looking to build the team up to get into the postseason. There's only certain prospects you need to hold on to, right? Generational guys, you know are generational guys. You get a guy in the first round, you know he's going to be amazing. Or he's going through and you're like, this guy's legit. Jason Dominguez is one of those guys, right? Like Since, since he was like 15 and signed with the Yankees, everyone's been like, this is a guy. You cannot get rid of this guy. He's going to be really good. He's going to really fit into the outfield. Do not trade him. Okay, that's fine. But the, the Parazas of the world or, or these other guys that, that they just put so much value on, you have – I get you You can't destroy your whole system for one player or one season. But at the same time, sometimes you have to move things and rebuild on the fly to, to win now. Like you have Soto now. You have Judge now. You have Cole now. These guys are not going to be getting better as the years go on. So why are we even worried about this guy that's not going to come up for four years? In four years, like you have, if you get rid of this guy that whose ETA is three years, you have three years to figure out how to replace this guy in 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 that in, in that system you were coming up with in that timeline you had. Like adjustments are are big in anything. They're big in sports. They're big in, in, in business. They're big in everything. And if you want to be successful, sometimes you have to adjust. And I feel like they, the Yankees just don't want to adjust. They don't want to adjust to like, well, we can't trade Peraza. Like he's going to be great in two years. But we don't need him to be great in two years. And we can figure out how to replace him in the system in two years. Whether it's another minor leaguer that can come up or, or other options. It's not like you can't find options at second base. You might not find someone that's 21, 
But there are options you could fill in at second base until you get that thing to replace it. I'm just trying to say I'm not a, I'm not all like trade everybody, trade everybody. I'm definitely not like that. I have more baseball sense than that. I really do. But when you're trying to build for today, you can't also think about tomorrow. Look at what the Warriors did. Let's switch sports on it. Look what the Warriors did. They tried to they tried to maintain the old era while mixing in the new era. And what happened? They now have Steph Curry on an expensive contract. Clay Thompson wants out. Draymond's just not as good as he used to be. And all of those young guys didn't work out because they didn't know how to to, to cement. They didn't know how to put them in. They didn't know how to put them in into that system. If you're thinking about today. Sometimes you can't think as strongly about tomorrow. <coughs> you do still have to think about tomorrow. I'm not saying don't think about tomorrow. But you can't, you, you can't say, I can't do anything today because I want to do it all tomorrow. You have to live every single day. And that's just not what the Yankees do. They're thinking so much about the future. They're thinking so much about, like, how... There were, mine, there, were, there were relief pitchers out there in July. Everyone with a brain knew Clay Holmes was not going to last the whole season. If, if you think about it, if you go look at his stats, like he might have decent stats. There's a big one that you got to look at because you, people say like, well, his ERA is a 2-2. But go look at runs given up. Go look at when he replaces a guy with a runner on first. That runner always comes home, but it doesn't go against Clay Holmes. So if he gives up a two-run home run, it's only one run. So he's, he gets one run given up. If he comes in with runners on second and third, you're the closer. You're looking to get out, second and third, two outs. Gives up a base hit, two runs come in. He comes out of the game. He gave up no runs. There's no That's no runs given up by him. It's whoever put him on. And I understand, like, yes, it, it should be that way. I'm not saying don't do that. Like, that's how it should be. But we can't then be like, well, he only has a 2-2 ERA. He's pretty good. No. <laughs> he, he, if you're the closer, if you're in the eighth inning, someone comes in, he gives up two hits, it's now second and third, two outs, and you're bringing in your closer. You're not bringing in your closer to be like, oh, I hope he gets him out. You're bringing your closer because that's supposed to be the best relief pitcher on staff. And he, I, it, since, since the dominance he had a couple years ago, no one has thought he's the best pitcher on staff, on the relief staff. No one's like, I want Clay Holmes in the game in the biggest situations. Because he it's a crapshoot. It's not I would rather have Chapman in, which is saying something, because he was all, he was on the same boat. But at least I knew eight times out of ten he was gonna he was gonna come in and do it. I when he would come into the game, especially, you know, not in, maybe in the last couple of years, but in his prime years when they traded him and got him back and all those years. When he would come into the game, I would at least be like, oh, Chapman's coming in the game. We're going to go for a ride, but we're going to win the game. He's going to load the bases on three straight walks, but then he's going to strike three straight guys out. Like, And then occasionally he wouldn't do it. But most of the time, he, he would give you a heart attack. He'd take a couple years off your life, but you had confidence he was going to get out of it. The minute Clay Holmes comes in and there's a base hit, I'm out. I'm like, he's not going to get this guy. That's it. The game's over. The game's over. Clay Holmes came in the other day, and, and, and don't know when you're listening to this, so I apologize for saying it all around Wednesday, September 25th. Clay Holmes came in the other day, gave up a run. Came in a couple days before that, gave up a run. He's just, he doesn't, I don't feel confident with him coming in the game. I almost say he shouldn't even be on the postseason roster. That's a tough statement, though, because you're going to need him. There's just not enough arms. It, you know, you need more arms in the postseason. That's just how it is. And, 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 you want to talk about a crapshoot, that sinker gets hot. No one's going to touch him. But the sinker hasn't been there. And he's a one-trick pony with the sinker. Like, yeah, he pitches that slider. He tries to do the sinker-slider combination, which was made absolutely famous by Jake Arrieta. He tries to do it, and, and, and you know, it's just not hitting. When you start seeing the slider multiple times, you know the sinker's not hitting, and you're like, that's it. It's already over. So that's that's my that's kind of doubled down on that rant. I can go back really quick because I don't think I, I closed out my initial thought. <clears throat> the minor leaguers. Anthony Volpe was a guy who was out of position that the Yankees were going to need. The minute they didn't get, um, not Machado, um, Turner, 
the minute they didn't go after Tatis when they were talking about trading for him, like all these star shortstops, uh, Lindor when he went to the Mets, you have to keep Volpe. And that was a good idea. I like Volpe a lot. Hard worker. Seems like a good dude. I've heard great stories about him. I like Anthony Volpe a lot. I'm glad they held on to him. But, like, go back in this. I mean, this isn't a new thing. What was it, 2016? They're talking about trading for Garrett Cole, and you had to give up the main piece was Miguel Andujar, and they said no. Back when Garrett Cole was on Pittsburgh, he didn't even have to make that stop in Houston. Although if he doesn't make that stop in Houston, who knows if he's the pitcher he is today because wink, wink, snug, snug with Houston, right? But, like, why not? Why why is Miguel Andujar a guy that had a great rookie year but is playing a position that is, that could be replaced? Like, why is he so much more important than one of the better starting pit, young starting pitchers in baseball? It just doesn't make much sense. It doesn't make much sense. I don't want to go too much more on the tangent there because I can go all day on this. I can go all day on the minor league staff or the minor league, the way the minor leagues are handled by the Yankees. It's just, it's, it's infuriating. It's frustrating. It's annoying. Um, but we're Yankee fans. We expect more from our, our team. But you know what? We still stand by them even when they frustrate the hell out of us. So, um, I think the Yankees are going to do good. I think they're going to have a good postseason run. I'm not ready to make my postseason um, my postseason predictions yet. I want to see how the season ends before I make my postseason predictions. But I think the Yankees are poised for a good run. I hope they do make a good run as a Yankees fan. But who knows? <laughs> I don't know if they. I don't know if they will or not. But we can we can only hope as Yankees fans that they do. All right. I was going to talk a little bit about hip hop. I said it in the beginning of the podcast, but I just talked about the Yankees for about 36 straight minutes. So we're going to save hip hop for another day. I'm sorry if I if I lured you in just to not follow through. But we're going to talk about hip hop another day um, because we got to get going. Unfortunately, episodes being 40 minutes is going to be the norm on the on the, the solo side because is a lot of work to be done. Can't sit here for two hours and talk to myself, unfortunately. I do that anyway. Maybe I should just mic myself up during the day. Um, but thank you guys so much for listening to another episode of Mad Props. Like I said, please uh, please subscribe to whether you're listening on Spotify or, you know, I, I know people like to listen on YouTube even. Please subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to our YouTube either way. Um, go check us out on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, X slash Twitter and and on LinkedIn as well at Schnabel Studios. We are doing a lot of big things around there, and we really appreciate all the support that we get on there. Um, you can also follow Mad Props at Mad Props Pod on Instagram and Facebook if you want to follow us there. Um, and you'll want to follow Schnabel Studios, although most of the stuff that goes on one goes on the other. So if you just follow Schnabel Studios, you'll see everything. So you may as well just go follow that anyway. We've got a couple new videos going up on the Schnabel Studios uh, YouTube page, so definitely go check that out. Um, don't have a release schedule or anything, so you just have to go and subscribe and notify for to, to see when we up, uh, upload. Not really doing that. Ring the bell, right? Ring the bell. If you ring the bell, you'll see all the stuff. I'm not saying that so you'll ring the bell. I'm saying that because I legitimately don't know what's going to go up when yet. We do not have a release schedule, but we have a couple highlight stuff going up. We'll have a couple mic'd ups going up. We'll have a couple fun things going up. So definitely um, definitely check that out if you uh, if, if you want to see some new stuff from Schnabel Studios. Go check out our Zeke video. It's Right now, it's just a short, but we do have a Zeke video out there right now on TikTok and on Instagram. Whichever one you prefer, make sure you subscribe to or follow us on Instagram and TikTok as well. Like I said, our TikTok has been doing pretty well. We went from last, I, I'm not even kidding, three days before recording this, we were at like 62 followers. We put out that Zeke video. It gave life to a couple other videos. Um, and in our last, I would say three of our last six videos are over 10,000 views now. And we went from 62 followers to over 430 followers, which is pretty cool. It's pretty cool to see the the influx of people that are, are watching our stuff and, and following us. So thank you, everybody, that's been following. If you're not already at schnabels.studios on TikTok to do that. All right, everybody, we're getting closer to that 100. I will try to get some more fun stuff planned for that. But for now, you just get my great voice and my great opinions and there'll be more episodes coming up um expect to hear kyle scott in one of these upcoming episodes because i went to my first 
high school football game in Dallas, Texas, and I came up with a huge revelation about high, about football as a whole, and uh, that's what I want to talk about today, but he wants to be on that podcast, so that'll probably be coming out next week, um, and hopefully we'll get more from there. All right, everybody, thank you so much again for listening to Matt Props. Please like and subscribe on all of our platforms, and we will catch you next time. See you later. Peace out.